March 30th, 2000. We had a generation of public figures uh, that uh, sold their souls to the mob. Youngstown, Ohio, where the mob owned the government. They shot a man who was elected to be the county prosecutor because they believed that they couldn't bribe him. I saw the pistol, I looked at his face, and I pivoted to my right, and he fired. Youngstown, where a federal strike force has netted more than 70 convictions. I got a funny feeling there's more, more to come. Youngstown, where the local congressman is now under a cloud of suspicion. The congressman's top aide is admitted to being a bag man for the mob. If there's anything I've done, it's something that anybody else in Congress has done. Tonight, Youngstown, still crime town, USA. From ABC News. This is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. There used to be a joke in Youngstown, Ohio. This was back in the late 50s and early 60s when the place was widely known as Crime Town or even Murder Town, Ohio. For two dollars, the joke went, a Youngstown barber will cut your hair. For three, he'll start your car. Car bombs were much in fashion back then. It was the mob's favorite way of dealing with competition. Between 1951 and 63, there were 75 bombings. The FBI investigated, as did the IRS. There was a certain level of civic indignation, but not much changed. Now, at last, things may be changing. The latest organized crime and public corruption investigations have led to 78 convictions in just one congressional district. And the congressman from that district, Democrat James Trafficant Jr., thinks the feds may be after him next. I'll be talking to Congressman Trafficant a little later in this program. So far, among those convicted, the county prosecutor, a judge, a second judge has been indicted but not convicted, two county commissioners, the sheriff, the county engineer, and the man who ran Trafficant's congressional office in Youngstown, who was an admitted bag man for the Youngstown mob. We begin with a couple of reports from Nightline correspondent, Chris Bury. There was a contract placed on my life because the Strollo organization knew that they couldn't fix cases with me. To understand just how brazenly and brutally organized crime has operated in Youngstown, consider what happened on Christmas Eve 1996 to the newly elected Mahoning County prosecutor. Paul Gaines was making a phone call in his kitchen when the door flew open and a man with a revolver walked in. I saw the pistol, I looked at his face and I pivoted to my right and he fired. And as I pivoted my arm, I swung my arm up and the slug went through my arm uh, into my side. He fired a second round as I was falling down. I fell on the floor, and the next thing I remembered, I woke up. The gunman squeezed the trigger a third time, but the revolver jammed, and he fled. Gaines was able to call for help before he passed out. They shot a man who was elected to be the county prosecutor because they believed that they couldn't bribe him. Jim Woolley helped prosecute mobsters in Youngstown for the U.S. Organized Crime Strike Force. He says the shooting of Paul Gaines was outrageous, even for the mafia. We've seen mobs rub out rival gamblers, rub out rival uh, mob people. But here you're talking about an elected public official who the mob believes they won't have any control over, stalking him, breaking into his home, and shooting him. This is absolutely off the charts. The bungled attempt to murder the county prosecutor turned out to be a pivotal moment for Youngstown. A team of FBI agents and federal prosecutors had already been investigating Ohio mobsters and their longtime grip on illegal gambling. But the shooting of Paul Gaines led them to a web of corruption connecting the mob to the very fabric of the courts, local government, and indeed everyday life in this county. I was awakened by a phone call. In March 1997, three months after he was shot, the county prosecutor got a call at home from a young woman. And she said, I know who shot you. The woman, jealous at being jilted, turned in her ex-boyfriend, a hired killer. He then guided federal agents to three other hitmen and right up the organization ladder to the boss of the Youngstown mob, Lenny Strollo. 
he cut a deal with federal prosecutors and agreed to cooperate. Lenny Strollo turns. Lenny Strollo gets charged with murder and turns. He's the mob boss. Unprecedented here. For 13 months, Lenny Strollo's house and phone lines had been bugged by the FBI. Those recordings picked up a virtual who's who of local officials, lawyers, and judges on the mob boss's payroll. What he wants to do is keep his illegal activities insulated from law enforcement. So you've got to bribe the police to look the other way. You've got to have a hand into prosecuting authorities because the people that are doing the things for you on the street get arrested from time to time, get in trouble from time to time. You need an ability to fix cases. In the last three years, the Youngstown investigation has led to more than 70 convictions and indictments, including Lenny Strollo and assorted mobsters, the Mahoning County Sheriff, his chief of detectives, the former county prosecutor, two judges, the county engineer, the police chief and law director of nearby Camel, Ohio, and two longtime associates of Youngstown's congressman, Jim Traficant. What does that say about Youngstown, Ohio? What it says about Youngstown, Ohio, is that we were, and I say we were, one of the most corrupt cities in the United States of America. And the prosecutions and the indictments will continue. Uh, what had happened in our community, I believe, is that the mob purchased every public office in the community. To some extent, they have been the government in this community. Attorney Jim Callan has spent much of his career trying to expose corruption in Youngstown. Are you saying here <clears throat> that much of the government of Mahoning County was, in effect, the mob? They had very close ties with the Mafia, uh, and some of them appear to have been uh, close associates of the Mafia. Uh, and to some extent, we were operating the criminal enterprise here. That criminal enterprise has further corroded a Rust Belt community already suffering from the closing of steel mills that for decades drove the economy here in the Mahoning Valley. But you got all these businesses here boarded up, mm -hmm. out of business. Yes. And what does that have to do with the mob? Well, uh, what happened in 1991, we jumped from 19 homicides here to 59. So there became a perception, particularly with the suburbs, that going to Youngstown is a... Uh, dangerous thing. A dangerous thing to do. So the impact is real, tangible, insidious. Crime exploded because corrupt judges took bribes to fix cases and free criminals. Roads crumbled because the crooked county engineer steered contracts to the mob. Business stayed away because of the notorious reputation Youngstown is still trying to live down. To this day, county prosecutor Paul Gaines packs a gun on his hip. He likens the mob to a cancer. You walk into a uh, hospital room and have a cancerous tumor, you're going to feel pain when they remove it. Well, we're removing this cancerous tumor. We had a generation of public figures uh, that uh, sold their souls to the mob. Absolutely. Uh, why, why try and hide it? Why try and lie about it? They let the people down. The people in this community are great people. They let the people down who elected them to public office. And today, those investigations continue all the way up to Youngstown's congressman, James Trafficant. That in part two of Chris Bury's report when we come back. This is ABC News Nightline. When the uh, mills were really thriving in Youngstown, there was a steady stream of workers pouring out of the mills with ready cash who were ready, willing, and able to sit down at gambling games and play. So there was plenty of money to be made from the rackets, from the gambling. Uh, there was the Cleveland faction and the Pittsburgh faction. Uh, and back in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s, uh, we had our share of car bombings. The media referred to us as Little Chicago. As the two factions vied for control of the city's rackets, so many mob bombings rocked Youngstown, 75 over a 12-year period, that in 1963, the Saturday Evening Post called it Crime Town, USA. There were a number of... Um... Uh, very violent killings. Uh, it culminated in a bombing uh, of a guy named Charlie Cadillac Cavallero, 
uh, in which he was killed, one of his sons was killed, and another one was uh, seriously uh, uh, injured. And that um, apparently was so brutal that it led to a peace for a decade or so. But in the early 80s, Youngstown's reputation took another hit. Jim Traffickant, the flamboyant county sheriff, was caught on tape talking to Charlie and Orland Carabia, two brothers in the Cleveland Mafia. In this excerpt, they discuss contributions Traffickant had taken from them and from the mob in Pittsburgh during his campaign. They have given $60,000. So we gave 60, what did we give? Okay, 103. Good. So now that's two-thirds two of the pie. The quite a bit there, right there. In his 1983 jury trial on federal charges that he took $163,000 of mob money, traffic and represented himself, though he's not a lawyer, and beat the Justice Department. His acquittal made him a folk hero, and he's now been elected to Congress eight times. But the Internal Revenue Service never bought traffic and story that he was somehow setting up a sting before he was even elected. There's a federal tax court that has examined all of the evidence, and it's concluded, among other things, that he accepted bribes from organized crime figures to ex uh, influence his performance as sheriff, uh, that he engaged in fraud to conceal it, and that he laundered the money, some of that money. Bliss bankrupted yesterday, putting 500 of my workers on the street due to two reasons. Number one, the continuing flood of illegal steel imports. In Congress, Trafficant is best known for his biting mistakes. speeches on Let behalf of no blue-collar workers and his bad haircuts, 70 suits, and trademark sign-off. Beam me up! But in the last few weeks, Youngstown's colorful congressman has been railing against an old enemy, the Justice Department that he worries will soon indict him again. A source close to the case confirms that Mr. Traffickant is now the target of a federal grand jury investigation. They better not make a damn mistake because I think the American people are fed up with being targeted and if there's anything I've done, it's something that anybody else in Congress has done and they're trying to make mountains out of molehills and I won't stand for it. His office has acknowledged turning over payroll and phone records. A grand jury has summoned a number of his staffers and FBI agents here in Youngstown are investigating allegations the congressman received gifts he never reported, including construction work on an elaborate horse barn and a couple of expensive cars. Then there are the congressman's friends. George Alexander, his legal advisor during the trial, pleaded guilty to encouraging that mob hit on prosecutor Paul Gaines. Charles Onesti, Traffickin's top aide in Youngstown for nearly 14 years, testified he was a bag man, taking money from the mob to a candidate elected county sheriff. I truly believe that uh, the congressman has used his office as a lounge for the mob. In the spring primary, State Senator Bob Hagan made the mob a major issue in his losing bid against Traffickant, who angrily denied any connections to organized crime. And I have a hell of a record, and the mob hates Jim Traffickant. In fact, Jim Traffigan's life has been threatened by the mob, and I've had about enough of it. That kind of bluster and bravado have always played well in Youngstown, where talk radio confirms Traffigan's local reputation of standing up for the little guy. Working hard for this community. You guys, you just pick things out of the air and attack this guy. Unfortunately, many of my listeners would like the the uh, FBI and law enforcement to leave us alone and get back to business as usual. The good news is the 70 indictments and convictions is evidence that we are moving in a positive direction. So we're, uh, we're going through a cleansing process which is necessary for our community. That famous magazine cover, Crime Town USA, still accurate? No. Uh, they can't function without public officials. Uh, we are identifying these public officials and we're prosecuting them. They're parasites and they siphon off the government, they siphon off good people and they're no good. And I'm here to tell you that and to tell them that. 
So this community seems at a crossroads. The convictions of so many mobsters and so many local officials clearly send a message that the mob will no longer run Youngstown the way it once did. But the county prosecutor who was shot and nearly killed for rebuffing the mobsters argues passionately that organized crime cannot succeed here unless the politicians are corruptible. And corrupt politicians, he insists, can only survive if the voters choose to keep them in office. This is Chris Bury for Nightline in Youngstown, Ohio. I spoke to Congressman Traficant earlier today. At the time, he declined our offer to hear Chris Bury's reports. He also limited our interview time to about six minutes. We'll be joined by Congressman James Traficant when we come back. And joining us now from Capitol Hill, Ohio Congressman James Traficant. Uh, Congressman, How someone, are you, Ted? I'm very well. As someone who's been serving his district now for, what is it now, 16, 17 years? 15 years. 15 years. You must be thrilled at the, at the way that the federal government and local authorities are starting to clean the place up. 78 convictions over the past few months. And it all started from 1980 when I ran for sheriff in a mob-dominated town, played brother against brother, danced between the raindrops, beat them with their own money, was indicted by the mob, and where the FBI was on the payroll of the mob. This is a hell of an ordeal, Ted, with a continuing animus from 1980 to the year 2000. Now you've got me, and you've I'm got giving me, them you've credit. Me, you've got me a little bit, you've got, me, you've got me a little bit confused here, Congressman. Don't get I, confused. Well, I'm then, giving them credit for what they've done, right. but even this last investigation, they used the predicate evidence and evidentiary material from the trafficking trial 20 years ago to officially go after these people. And apparently, uh, you know, some of the people they went after, I mean, when you say you're giving them credit, at least three of the people they went after and three of the people they convicted are old friends of yours, people who worked for you. That's right. Now, the you, one person you, lied to me to protect his sons, who are two of the finest people in our valley, the Onestes, and he lied to me to try and shield me from political problems. Once I knew about it, he was separated, Ted. He's now deceased. Now, what's going to happen to you? Do you think you're going to be indicted? Well, let me, let me say this to you, Ted. They could have got the stuff they got on me out of the library. It surfaces right before election. I doubt if there's any politician in America that could have been reelected with the buzzard circling and the shark circling with all the leaks coming out of the federal government. So I think they have to indict me, because if they don't, I can prove a false confession 20 years ago, a continuing animus through all these years, and I'm going to sue them. I'm either going to be going to jail, Ted, or I'm going to be one of the richest guys you've ever interviewed, but there's no in-between. I'm going to fight them. What are they, they going to indict you on, do you think? I don't know. I'm not leaking anything. They are. But when I go to court, I'm going to represent myself. Well, you must have some sense of what it is because, Ted, I, because, I, don't I, know. because I heard I you. I do not know. Let me finish the question. Because I heard you on C SPAN just the other day in which you were saying that basically what they're coming after you for, every congressman up there has done at one time or another. What were from you talking about? From what I'm about? hearing from the people they're talking to, that's evidently the whole situation. You're a member of Congress, you help people in your district. But let me say this. But what were, you know what were you talking about specifically, though? I mean, I'm when, not talking about anything specifically. Well, if, if and I'm not on if trial. If Are you a representative of the government, Ted? Hell no. I'm if just, they I'm, want to I'm, charge me, charge me, Jim Trafficking is coming to court. I'm going to look them in the eye again, representing myself without an attorney. And here's what I want to say. Get your best hold. I think too many Americans fear our government. And let's look back now. Forty years ago, J. Edgar Hoover said there was no organized crime. And the reason he did that, Ted, because he was a transvestite with a woman's dress with photographs that the mob compromised them. No now, one, I no one, know, no one Mr. Me. Trafficant, has hear ever me. accused you of being anything less than colorful. But hear since, me. But since, hear you're me. since you're insisting on this interview only being six and a half minutes. That's right. At least How let much me get, time at least have? let me, oh, you got about a minute and a half left. Right you, you ought to be able to go through a few more stories about But I want to know Uber. why the FBI has never been investigated in Youngstown. Youngstown has got a dirty eye. And you know why it's got that dirty eye? Not from the politicians there. The FBI was corrupt. The FBI agent in charge, Stan Peterson, who could sue me as I speak, Ted, was on the payroll of the mob. And when he retired, he was appointed the chief of police of Youngstown. Well, and I'm tired of Youngstown getting bad rapped 
when they're nothing compared to Pittsburgh, Cleveland, New York, and Chicago, and let's get off it. The, the FBI was corrupted in Youngstown, and I'm going to prove that in this trial. Since you have already mentioned uh, the particular gentleman from the FBI there, you were sheriff at the time. If you knew that about him, why didn't you arrest him? I didn't know it till my trial. And soon as I said that I suspected him, he retired as the chief of police of Youngstown. Was anything now, I'm not ever... on the house floor, Ted. He could sue me, but here's what came out at my trial. The affidavit said that he was appointed chief of police of Youngstown, was on the payroll of the mob, and the agent who submitted the affidavit did not ask for an investigation. This Justice Department is out of control, you want my opinion? But let me tell you, a son of a truck driver from Samuel Street, I have a better chance than most of the people have had from our valley. But our valley doesn't deserve the bad rap they're getting. The FBI should be investigated, and I'm gonna announce this on your show. I am submitting a Freedom of Information Act request this week on Stan Peterson and the corruption of the FBI in Youngstown, period. Congressman, we uh, ran out of the time that you gave me about 20 seconds ago, but I thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for having me. I'll be back in a moment. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, the latest on the impasse in the Elian Gonzalez case. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.